welcome back to another video of ULAN's video series, AP Psychology. And today we'll be, we'll be talking about um, one point, Unit 1.3, um, which is defining psycho psychological science and the experimental method. So just um, please like this video and subscribe, my and subscribe to my channel if you really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, so if you didn't if you don't know who I am, I'm Yulan. Um, I took AP Psychology, or I self-studied AP Psych last year, and I scored a 5 on it. And here I'm going to share some of my material that I used to prep, um, prepare for the exam and um, cover some of the main content and some key concepts that will be really like um, occurs a lot during on the exam, actual exam. So yeah, just check this video out. Okay, so... Can you... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about types of research first. So there are two types, but which is basic research and applied research. Basic research um, <coughs> is performed to learn something. For example, you may, um, and it's used to expand upon knowledge, and it aims to have new knowledge and perspective about a particular topic. <coughs> Excuse me. So some uh, one example of basic research is that um, you're studying you're studying like the relationship between um, social media and brain, and you are just like curious about um, or like social media and the brain. Yeah, and like you're just curious about how they're related and what are some correlations. So you are not like actually using this for like applied, um, like for actual uh, for an actual practical re um, pra practical use. So this is called a basic research. And then we have applied research, which answers specific questions and is used to solve a problem or do something of practi practical use, which is the opposite of basic research. Um, an example would be. Um, let me think. Um, trying to trying to find a cure for obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah. And just uh, like something unrelated, obsessive compulsive disorder (OCD) is a neurological disorder. Or like it's like a psychological disorder, and we'll be covering this in our later units of the like neurotransmitters and etc. And here comes our scientific method. So like a lot of other sciences, well, I'm sure maybe you've learned this in chem chemistry or biology, but um, psychology ones are actually a lot shorter. Or like, <clears throat> it's, no, it's basically the same, but like the key, um, it's really key to know some of the like key um, vocabulary for AP psychology exam in particular. So first you need to make a theory um, and, they will try, and researchers will try to try and explain the behavior that we're observing. Um, so <clears throat> this example uses naturalistic observation. And this theory would then produce a hypothesis, which is like a testable prediction that could be repeated um, um, by future sci scientists who are interested in this topic, where they just want to make sure that the data that were extracted from the experiment is actually precise and accurate. OK, and then. Um, however, series could bias our observations. Um, example, think about it. If you want to prove your theory is correct, you try and make it so the results prove it. So yeah, just make it more test. So in order to provide those kind of biases, um, um, psychologists often use um, something called an operational definition. Um, so yeah, because so first you need to um, make a really clear statement. Um, the exact procedures used in the study, which would eventually allow other researchers to replicate the research, as I mentioned previously. Um, for example, if you wanna like test or like uh, test or know or like do an experiment on human intelligence, you may you may have said like how smart someone is, which is really broad and general, um, measured by their grades. But this is a biased definition because um, grades, as all you, as you all know, doesn't really mean doesn't have like a direct a positive correlation with your actual IQ. Um, the operation of the definition could be what an intelligence test such as such as an IQ test measures. So just make it really clear so that people don't get confused and like maybe um, have like different definitions for this topic and thus have different outcomes. And then we have the types of variables. 
Um, this is also will be mentioned in other or like taught in other sciences class. So we have independent variables, which is the variable that changes in experiments. And if you draw a graph, this will be on the x-axis. Um, and then we have dependent variable, which is the consequence or the outcome of the due to the change of independent variable. And on the graph, this will be on the y-axis. Um, yeah, for example, in the um, let's do an um, example. So a researcher wanted to see how sleep affects performance on a certain exam. The researcher will change the amount of sleep given to the subject in order to see any changes. And this is the independent variable, which um, is the amount of sleep. And the dependent variable in this example um, is the sleep. Oh no, the performance on the exam is a dependent variable because performance on the exam depends on the independent variable, which is sleep. Okay, um, and then we have confounding variables, which are the outside influence um, factors that could change the effect of dependent and, dep and independent variables. <clears throat> For example, say <clears throat> there's a correlation between crime and sale of ice cream. As the ice cream um, as the crime rate increases, ice cream sales also increase. So one might suggest that criminals cause people to buy ice cream or that purchasing ice cream causes people to commit crimes, which is really um, kind of, I would say, nonsense. However, both are extremely unlikely. So um, there's a really key concept called causal effect. Um, if the part it basically states that if the participants are aware of being observed by other researchers, um, maybe from like research methods like naturalistic observation, they're more likely to change their behaviors unintentionally or intentionally, I, I don't know. That's impacting the final outcome of the naturalistic observation. Um, and also, it's like confounding variables is really important as um, it, it includes a new outside variable that's not present, present, present in the original experiment. Um, for example, in the in the previous ice cream example, um, the weather, which is smelling, and uh, which are the, like the sunlight and heat, could also help um, cause ice cream to melt even faster. So this could be like a um, the key factors that are not actually um, like assessed in the ice cream um, I don't know experiment example. And finally, we have the control variable which is kept the same throughout an experiment and is usually used to compare with, it, uh, with the dependent variable or like the final outcome from the independent variable. Um, for example, if a researcher <coughs> wants to see how sleep affects performance on a test, um, I was too lazy, so I used this previous example. The control variables could be the test, sleeping atmosphere, and the type of bed. And all those things could actually change um, like the how how students perform on the test so yeah so in order to reduce those things that might cause the outcome to have like different from the actual outcome um we need to use the same sleeping at same sleeping atmosphere and same type of bed and etc okay and here comes the our next section cause and effect there are two things that you need to memorize in this section the first one is random assignment which and states that when participants were divided into different experimental group with an equal chance of being cho chosen. So it doesn't, um, so everyone has a chance to be in this, either control group or the experiment group. So it doesn't really matter or like it's entirely depend on luck or chance. Okay, and then we have random sample. Um, and each, um, which states that each individual in the entire population has an equal chance of being selected to participate in an experiment. Um, yeah, so random sample is kind of similar to random assignment, but random sample is from the entire population to the um, to this particular experiment, and random assignment is from this particular experiment and then divide participant into different groups. So yeah, I think that's better for you to memorize it. And then we have the types of bias. Um, two, um, there are two basically two biases. The first one is sampling bias which is a result of a flawed sampling process that uh, produces an unrepresentative uh, sample. And the second one is experimenter bias, when researchers themselves influence the results of the experiment to portray a certain outcome. And in order to reduce um, the chance of um, exper experimenter bias, 
Um, double-blind procedure is often, con uh, def often conducted or used by psychologists. Um, and <clears throat> how this actually works is that neither researcher nor participants know which groups they've been assigned to. So this reduces the bias um, from a great ex um, extent. And then we have, um, yeah, because of those three main concepts that we'll, we'll mention in this um, slideshow, um, researchers cannot really like believe their gut or like the common sense that people usually say because of yeah those three concepts the first the first one is hindsight bias which is a tendency to believe that you knew something was going to happen as if um as if you foresaw the event i knew it all along and then we have overconfidence um as the name suggests we are like really overconfident um, in what we believe or we find or discover which misleads our um like mis misleads others for like actually myself about the actual truth like you might be um like i don't know don't believe what others says and you only believe what you think is right okay and the third one is we perceive ordering events that are completely random for example um for instance, you can see this with coin flips. Flips, if you were to ask a group of students to flip a coin 50 times and record data, you'd be able to easily tell who actually did the assignment and who thought they could just make up the results. Those that actually did the assignment would have had long chains of heads or long chains of tails, like H H H H H T T T T T T T. While those that didn't would just alternate between the two, such as H T H T H T H T H T, we're generally unable to understand randomness since we're always try to make sense of it. So yeah, just try to avoid bias and common sense where when you are doing an experiment. And I would say hindsight bias and overconfidence are often tied on on the multiple choice section because it will give you like a scenario as always, and they will ask you um what kind of bias or like common sense that the, this person, those people make um, that lead to a different outcome of the actual results. Okay, so here are some practice questions. Number one, Sean is a researcher who is trying to understand how to make employees more efficient in the workspace. What type of research is he, con is he conducting? A. Experimental research, B. Correlational research, C. Basic research, and D. Applied research. Pause the video and see if you can get the right answer. Okay, so the answer is applied research because John, uh, Sean is trying to understand employees and workspace, which are really practical, um, which are some like practical uses. Um, so it's actually apply, applied to like working um, and jobs. So it's applied research. Question number two, the issue of exper experimenter bias could be avoided by A, minimizing communication between experimenter and subjects, B, not informing participants of the hypothesis, C, telling participants there are no right or wrong answers, D, use a double blind procedure. Pause the video. Okay, so the answer is D, using a double blind procedure. Um, as you may remind, remember, um, double blind procedure basically says like researchers and uh, nor researchers, um, neither researchers nor participants know which group they are in. So like they couldn't really change their behavior. So they would just like act normal and see what's the results. Number three, in the hypothesis, children who take a nap every afternoon will score higher on a subsequent intelligence test. What is the dependent variable? A, test scores, B, children, C, time of the day, and D, napping. Pause the video. The answer is test scores. Um, so um, we're asking the dependent variable. So the nap is the independent variable, and independent variable leads to the outcome or like the dependent variable. And it says like um, score higher, which is the test score. So number, um, choice A is the correct answer. Number four, and I think this is the last question. Which of these is not basic research? A, finding how information processing works. B, finding ways to treat psychological disorders. C, finding out about social perceptions about others. D, finding links between the brain and mind. Pause the video. So the answer is B, finding ways to treat psychological disorders. Again, um, if it's not a basic research, then it will probably be uh, applied research. So psychological disorder is an used is actual like 
um, finding ways to treat psychological disorders, which, which is a practi practical use that will be used in reality, reality to solve the problems of those patients. So, um, yeah, B is the correct answer. And here's the end of our, this um, lecture. Thank you for listening and please like this video and subscribe as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. And if you're interested, please subscribe and wait for my future videos to come out on neuroscience content and AP Psychology prep. Thank you.